From Deloitte's AI Institute, this is AI Ignition. A monthly chat about the human side of artificial intelligence with your host, Bina Amanov. We'll take a deep dive into the past, present, and future of AI, machine learning, neural networks, and other cutting edge technologies. Here's your host, Bina. Hello, my name is Bina Amanat and welcome to another episode of AI Ignition. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Kay Firth Butterfield. She is the head of AI and machine learning and also a member of the executive committee at the World Economic Forum. Welcome, Kay. Welcome, Kay. It's great to have you in today's show. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Um, How are you doing in these terribly troubled times? I'm, you know, you can only look at the positive things at times like this, uh, that, you know, I'm healthy, my family's healthy, and that that's all you can hope for. And we are busy uh, at work, at school. So I'm doing good considering everything else that's going on in the world. Yes, yes. As you say, we need to look at those positives. Um, f- yes, yes, indeed. So, uh, Kay, I am so glad to sit down with you and have this conversation. You have a very interesting role at the World Economic Forum. We've interacted a few times. And I'm just curious, what does a day in the life of Kay look like nowadays? Well, obviously very different from what a day in the life of Kay looked like this time last year. Uh, Because this time last year, I had just come back from two months of being in India and Colombia and Russia and Switzerland and the UK and um, speaking at some really interesting events like for example Wired but um, now I'm still speaking so I'm still doing lots of speeches and these wonderful um, events like this Uh, but I'm doing them from my home office and uh, not having to go out at all. And actually, you know, that's absolutely wonderful because it means that we can have these conversations. Um, I can speak in Australia one day and and Europe the next. And, and, And so actually, I think that it's very empowering because many more people know about the things that we're actually doing than could possibly have known if I was on a plane all the time, going to various places. So I think that, you know, one of those um, things that a day looks like is very often a a speech or an interaction like this. So um, another piece of a day would be the envisioning and leadership. So what are we what are we doing as a team and where are we going? Um, empowering all the people who work with us to really do their best in this very interesting and important area of AI and AI ethics and AI for good. And yeah. I think the third thing is I'm always looking to collaborate. You know, we want to make sure that everybody's best ideas are out there and we're not just reinventing the wheel when we're thinking about what we do next and you know you work across several countries and several regions several industries ai is such a broad topic right what are some of the exciting things that's happening in this world uh, of ai that you are excited about and that you are really focusing on Yes, certainly. So um, we tend at the moment to do more of the foundation building pieces. So uh, you'll often hear me say, we can't go on and build great things with AI and use it for all the beneficial purposes we want to, unless we make sure that we deal with building it some firm foundations. So making sure that there's ethical or or just problems that we see uh, like bias or explainability those sort of things um, we deal with now so that we we build our house on on foundations of stone 
So uh, that's really what a lot of our work is. And you're right, you know, we, do, we, we have officers doing this work now in five continents. And we work with governments, um, businesses, nonprofits, uh, philanthropic foundations, okay. international organizations, and, and um, of course, business to make sure that we've got the right stakeholders in the room yeah. and to really think about it so that governments don't regulate where actually they don't need to regulate and soft law would be better. So, for example, we um, did some work with the United Kingdom where um, we worked with them to create procurement rules for artificial intelligence and also that workbook that the procurement officers actually need in order yeah. to, um, to work out what high-level high principles yeah. are about. And, um, you know, we, that came into force in the UK in July, and now we're working with the US, with the government of Australia, with some other governments in Latin America and the MENA region, um, so that it's about, you know, making sure that what we do is so well thought out and has so many stakeholders that it's transportable to different places. Yeah, yeah. And you know what you described about setting the foundation, that, that is so important. Now, what do you see from an industry lens? Do you see, uh, uh, obviously, you look across all these different industries. Do you see certain industries ahead in getting the foundation right? Or are there uh, still a lot of opportunities to improve on those foundational aspects of AI? I think that the true tech companies and, of course, the professional services companies like yourselves are really ahead in the thinking uh, around ethical AI or responsible AI or, just as I usually put it, the problems that come with using some of these tools. Yeah. And that's yeah. because you've had to be. You were the first movers in this market. And so now we're seeing other companies, and I do believe that all companies will eventually be AI companies, but now we're seeing some of the other companies that are using artificial intelligence, perhaps in one or more vertical, mm -hmm. seeing that just as it might be damaging to the brand value of some of the other companies that have already traveled this journey, it is also potentially dangerous for them as well. And so then they're entering into, well, what do we do next with the with this ethics piece? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think one of the ways I found thinking about it uh, uh, and uh, tell me how, you know, how you think about um, the impact of technology, right? Because if you think about it, there are three parallel streams moving along, growing at varied speeds. Right. There is the core technology itself, whether it's quantum computing or the next wave of deep learning algorithms. Uh, you know, there's a core technology that's being developed. Then there's the applications of the technology, uh, which is the second stream, which is across all these industries and different functions where it's being used. And then there is the third part, which is the consequences, the risks or, you know, where we think about ethics. Right. When you apply a technology that is still being developed, and you apply it in a real world use cases, obviously there are impacts that nobody has thought about. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's great to hear about your focus on ethics and really, you know, at the World Economic Forum, it's, uh, it's amazing to see the kind of work that you're doing uh, with ethics specifically and really coming up with those guidelines because that's, not, that's, a, that's a playbook that doesn't exist today. Um, are there any industries or are there any areas you think that AI will not touch or will not have as much of an impact as, um, say, some of the other industries like where we've heard financial services or healthcare? We lit uh, almost every you know industry seems to be impacted by AI. In your perspective, do you think there will be industries or jobs that will not get impacted by AI? 
Yes, well, I think it depends upon the timeline that you apply to that question. But just if I can, um, before I answer that question, I wanted to come back and say I agree with you entirely about those three streams with regard to AI that you just talked about. And um, and I think that uh, everybody, every company will at some stage be in one of those streams and, and also we have to decide as a world um, what we want to govern and how we want to govern it. So do we want to govern applications, for example? And mm -hmm. do we want to think about high-risk um, examples? So the, the obvious one there might be facial recognition. Uh, we might say facial recognition used in law enforcement. Uh, we see that as a high risk. And so we really need to look at that more carefully than facial recognition for cows, um, which is actually happening in India to help with yeah. agriculture. And yeah. and so, so, you know, I think there are very careful gradations that we have to think about. And, you know, it's a nuanced place to be working. But then yeah. going, going back to, to your question, um, I always said that I felt that my hairdresser would be um, one of the last people to lose her job to automation. And then during lockdown, I was reading something in, in one of the newspapers, uh, online, of course, um, and uh, somebody had created and it didn't do a very good job but somebody had created a hair cutting machine uh -huh. <laughs> which, which i don't it, it wasn't obvious whether it was aut autonomous but it was certainly a robot cutting his hair so i uh, so that's why i said i think it depends upon the timeline um because at the moment you know our robots are not terribly um, good at manipulating things, but obviously over a, over a longer period, even those jobs that seem very safe at the moment, I, I think will, will be automated. And so, um, ballet, that was one I was thinking about ballet and maybe oh. opera and singing, you know, yeah. we might, we might not want to go and listen to see, see, um, robots dancing but then again maybe we will there's so much to unpack there and you, you know at the end of the day necessity is in, uh, uh, drives a lot of innovation I, I mean i'm going to share this but i ended up cutting my own hair last week and i think it turned out okay and i might never go to a hairdresser maybe once in two three years uh, but well I, I think yeah i mean certainly it turned out okay and, um, you know, I, with me, I just let mine keep growing and growing and yeah. growing. <laughs> yeah, we certainly see that. Uh, it's fascinating about the singing and dancing robots, right? I think the creative arts are less likely to be impacted. But one interesting application that I've seen is where they are trying to recreate um, uh, the voices especially of singers who have passed away, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, if um, Frank Sinatra can sing some of the newer songs, I mean, I love his voice. Not everybody is his fan, but it would be great if AI can, you know, continue to release new songs and, and the whole ethical implications around that, right? That's why this whole topic mm -hmm. of ethics and the consequences of the application of technology is fascinating for me. And I know you focus a lot on the governance aspect and you think a lot about ethics as well. What's a, you know, what would be a good structured way to think about ethics? What are some of the best practices that you've learned? What are some of the approaches that you've seen that actually work and encompass um, the different aspects of ethics? Yes, certainly. Um, I, I think maybe we just need to uh, unpick Frank Sinatra's voice. I too love Frank Sinatra. But I wonder whether actually just um, having him sing new songs is a, is, a, is a form of deep fake. And we should be thinking about, about that. And also, you know, I, I'm obviously a bit of an opera buff or that's why I brought it up but um, you know would I want to listen to an AI enabled Pavarotti 
singing. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure. Um, yeah, it's something that it, it it's almost in that uncanny valley feeling. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> anyway, back to the governance. Um, and maybe that's a governance issue in itself. Um, and uh, probably one would have to go to the trustees of an estate to help them uh-huh. think that through. Yeah. So, um, yes, what a be- best practice. I think that uh, the best thing is to make sure that if you're a company or a government, you have a plan for your use of AI. And so, you know, I have certainly been saying to countries, you really need a national AI strategy um, because a company like Deloitte would not plan to bring in something like artificial intelligence and use it without having a strategy behind it. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the, that, that should be the same for countries, especially because countries are going to have to think about how do they use it? How does it interact with their, with their citizens? And are there issues like the use of facial recognition um, in law enforcement that might be a step too far for either the country or their citizenry. And so having that sort of strategic thought. So for countries, I think it's really important. But as I've said, for companies too. So one of the things that we we did was create a toolkit for boards to help those directors understand what AI is and... Um, and also to understand what it means to have oversight of AI applications that are happening in their, in their companies. And of course, okay. many board, many directors really didn't understand this new technology. So we hope that or that's, we say that that's a version of governance, yeah. but it's, it's there to help so that um, those, those directors can do a better job of governing their companies. And now, of course, we're moving on to the C-suite version, and we're delighted to have Deloitte's help. Thank you so much um, in that C-suite version of the toolkit. And whilst I'm saying thank you, I mentioned the procurement work that we did with the UK government. That also was a partnership with Deloitte. So, um, you know, it's wonderful to have you not only talking about it and thinking about it, but actually working with us on some of these governance issues. Yes, yes. No, I think, you know, um, because of our audit DNA and advisory DNA, you know, putting trust at the center of everything that we do, uh, specifically in AI, it is so crucial. So we actually developed a framework that looks at AI ethics holistically and cuts across all the different industries, right? Like, for example, bias might be important when you're looking at the consumer space, right? But uh, but bias may not be relevant if you're looking at um, predicting when a factory flow machine might fail. So you have to think about, you know, the different consequences and ethical implications based on the use case. As you were saying for facial recognition, such a great example, you know, it. AI is so context specific and the nuances, the ethics around using AI depends on the application and the use of AI. And we we love working with the World Economic Forum uh, because it uh, gives us a preview into you know, driving a broader impact because I, I personally and uh, I personally do believe that for AI to reach its full potential, we need to have that foundation right and ethics has to be a part of that foundation. Um, and you mentioned, you know, the work that we've done for the C-suite and the board members that uh, that we're working on. Uh, what would your advice be to companies who are very early in their AI journey? or even countries who are still very early in their AI journey, who have, don't have an AI strategy, who, don't, who are still figuring out what to do, how could AI be used in their business or in their day-to-day work? What would be your guidance? Well, I think my guidance to a company would be, first of all, read the tools that we have produced. So, you know, obviously things like the toolkits, but also um, 
If you're thinking of using, and a lot of companies are thinking of using AI and talent acquisition, that can get you in a lot of trouble if you don't do it properly. And yeah. um, you, we all know the story of the of the bank that ended up own, with its algorithm only looking at white men from a certain university or couple of universities um, <laughs> because it had been badly trained and. Right. You know, we need diversity actually in our companies um, and we can do very, we can do some really crazy things and get it very badly wrong if we, if we don't look at each place that we want to use AI. So don't be, I would also say don't be, um, don't be pushed with the everybody will yeah. everybody will be using AI or you have to get AI. You know, make it a thoughtful choice to buy artificial intelligence and learn about the ethical issues beforehand and think about where are you going to use it and how you're going to use it and how you're going to build those firm foundations. So maybe you want a chief AI ethics officer, for example, and look to companies like, like Deloitte and others who have already navigated some of this work okay. so that you can draw from those tools and draw from the forums tools. So I think that would be my best advice to companies and with countries. Yeah. Yes, you know, now we, we've got sort of in the 30s and 40s number of countries with strategies. So there are yeah. examples to learn from. We wrote a white paper which actually tells a country how to draft a, draft a national AI strategy. And also we're beginning to see countries say, OK, we have these, this ethics chapter in our national AI strategy. How do we operationalize that? And so we've been working with India um, to think about how to operationalize it. So, you know, go and it's out at the moment for review, public review go and review it um, and see, see where your future might lie. So, Kay, you know, you've had a, a, an interesting journey to get to uh, the, the role that you're in today. Can you share a little bit with our audience on uh, how you got to the current role? What's your background? Yeah, yes, of course. Well, I am the living example that, you know, you can have more than one career in a, in a lifetime. And I think that, you know, that's something that our children are going to um, have to understand and prepare for. So that sort of lifelong learning. Um, in fact, my daughter is a pilot with the US Air Force. And wow. I keep telling her that her job is going to disappear because of AI. So um, that too will be a multifaceted career. Um, so my, I've started my life as a barrister. That's the wig and gown lawyers um, <laughs> in, in England. And uh, really thinking about human rights and children's rights. And so have always been worried about the state of the world, really. Um, I was then invited to sit as a judge. Uh, you know, there's an interview process and things like that. Um, and I didn't want to be a full time judge. So at that stage, um, I thought to myself, well, what am I going to do with my life? Um, and I was fortunate enough to be asked to be a professor um, yeah. and I taught law and international relations and really became immersed in my research in thinking about what AI would look like in the geopolitical space and um, in the human rights space. So that, that's, that brought my careers together um, uh, very neatly um, and um, then was one of the first people really thinking about this. Yeah. Um, and so I was invited to be the world's first chief AI ethics officer. And that was in 2014, when yeah. it was still very rare for us yeah. to be yeah. Uh, yeah, in this space. And then, of course, I moved to the forum in 2017, having already set up a 
a non-profit to think about um, how one audits uh, artificial algorithms um, and with some friends uh, in Austin, Texas. Wow. That's fascinating, you know, and uh, yeah, I think um, the job, AI creates a lot of jobs, you know, but we hear a lot about AI displacing jobs. And, uh, you know, one question, uh, given your career path and how you have got here, uh, what's your advice to uh, students uh, who are studying today, who are in colleges, or high school, how should they think about a career in AI? Well, I think first of all, they should think about a multifaceted career like mine. So, you know, don't expect that the that the career that you get into now as you come out of college is going to necessarily exist in 10 years yeah. time. So I yes. think that um, actually, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time thinking about STEM but we also need to make sure that we have that humanities piece in because we have to ensure that we bring what we create, what we are educating our children is around critical thinking and analytical yeah. thinking and, um, and that lifelong learning so that you can be a scientist and you can be a historian. So much more of that sort of combination because frankly, none of us have got any idea what the jobs of the future will look like, but you are looking at one of the jobs of the future. My job yeah. didn't exist Yeah. six years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and maybe yeah. yours too. <laughs> Mine did too. Mine did not, right? Uh, so, you know, because, uh, but I also think uh, because of uh, AI's needs for domain experts, right? I think this could, AI could actually turn out to be an equalizer, right? To get real diversity infused in tech and primarily in AI, because we're going to need more and more domain experts who understand AI and need to be part of the AI journey, right? And you you are the living example for that, right? The combination of skill sets that you had, the experience, and then bringing it, tying it in with AI and bringing that unique lens is how we make progress. Um, I, I do think AI can be an equalizer. It's going, you know, through lifelong learning, we're going to get more and more diverse perspectives. At least that's my hope. I'm an optimist. So, uh, you know, I hope this can be an equalizer for us to get diversity into AI. Um, you yeah, know, me too. You know, <laughs> like both of our jobs didn't exist um, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, I, uh, I certainly did, you know, didn't think that AI would get so real and, you know, accelerate so fast as where we are today, right? Um, what's, a, you know, what do you th think that uh, a new job that has been created in the past 10 years that actually caught you by surprise? Oh, um, I, I, I suspect the, the being a driver of a driverless car, that, yeah. see, that seems a, a, I mean, it's obviously critical, but um, it, it seems sort of <laughs> strange that you're sitting behind the wheel of a car that's driving itself. So as I say, absolutely important for the governance, but just a slightly curious um, curious uh, career yeah yeah okay this has been a fascinating discussion you are clearly a visionary in this space and paving the path for so many to build ai responsibly uh, i've really enjoyed our conversation how can our audience stay connected with you and follow you uh, what's the best way to stay engaged with uh, with the work that you're doing well, certainly, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And one of the most important things is that here we are, two women working in AI. And so it's, as I say, a pleasure to have been working with you. And I think just picking up on what we said last, it's so important that we diversify uh, the people who come into artificial intelligence 
And that's right. obviously one of the ways that we will begin to deal with the issue of bias. So keeping in touch is always wonderful to keep in touch with people who are inspired by anything that we talk about. And so the best way is AI at weforum.org. So that's the AI team that I lead at the forum. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. Check out our AI Ignition page on the Deloitte AI Institute website for full video and podcast episodes. And tune in next time for more thought-provoking conversations with AI leaders around the world. This podcast is produced by Deloitte. The views and opinions expressed by podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Deloitte. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice or services of any kind. For additional information about Deloitte, go to Deloitte.com backslash about.